A hundred years ago, 15 motion picture photographers in the early days of Hollywood formed a group to exchange ideas on the artistry of camera work. They would soon become the American Society of Cinematographers. The ASC is the oldest and possibly most exclusive cinema society in the world, an organization where membership is by invitation only and one of the highest honors in filmmaking. Over the decades, the ASC has followed its mission to stay on the forefront of evolving technology while promoting education through master classes led by members mentoring the next generation of cinematographers. Housed in one of the oldest buildings in Hollywood, entering the home of the ASC is an amazing experience for any film lover. It's a museum of one-of-a-kind film cameras that recorded countless classic films of Hollywood. Stunning behind-the-scenes photos, an amazing cinema memorabilia, from one of the Lumiere Brothers' cinematographs to the Mitchell BNC2 camera that Greg Tolan used to shoot Citizen Kane. To mark the centennial of the ASC, we sat down in the clubhouse off Hollywood Boulevard to chat with four ASC cinematographers. Capping off our series marking the ASC Centennial, it was a privilege for the Full Exposure crew to be invited to record the August episodes. And for the last of four interviews from Hollywood, I was really delighted to have a chance to speak with legendary cinematographer Dean Cundy. To multitudes of cinephiles, Dean's career as a visual storyteller needs no introduction. From his childhood fascination with set design to his partnerships with directors like Spielberg, Zemeckis, and Carpenter, Dean Cundy is considered by countless cinema fans as one of the most prolific and influential cinematographers of the last four decades. Dean's filmography reads like an IMDb chart of box office groundbreaking movies and blockbuster genre classics like Halloween, The Thing, Escape from New York, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Back to the Future, and Jurassic Park, to name just a few. And as befits a young man fortunate enough to learn from the likes of cinematographer James Wong Howe, who also taught film students, Dean is regularly involved in mentoring aspiring DPs through the ASC Master Class Program. Dean, it's a great honor to meet you and be here in this hallowed space oh, and well, historical space. Thank you very much. You know, I, I never come here without thinking about the past and being amazed at you know, what I've been able to do, hmm. um, you know, to accomplish my my dream in life, so. Yeah, I mean, when you first walk in here, it's uh, for any lover of film, especially for any aspiring cinematographer, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a jaw-dropping experience. Oh, yeah. And we we have such a, an embodiment of of film history, of cinematography history, you know, starting with, like, the magic lantern back there to, um, you know, the most contemporary uh, digital cameras. So it's a great place to come and look and and have a tangible connection to the past. Mm. I mean, of course, I was immediately drawn to the, the Mitchell uh, that was uh, mm. Greg Tolan shot much <clears throat> of Citizen Kane with. And yeah, and, and again, that's, that's sort of what I always feel is when I come here and I see the actual real uh, device that made film history mm -hmm. and the fact that I can go and touch mm -hmm. cameras that were, some of them probably made film history, others were just working cameras that um, created the film industry and the art of cinematography. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mentioned uh, the word aspiring, you know, and um, I know that uh, I've read and you know seen a few interviews with you where you talk about what was your first real influence in um, wanting to not just get into film but to be a cinematographer. Um, would you tell us just a little bit about that? It may have you know may have been talked about a lot, but I think it's just a, it's a really uh, interesting story about inspiration. When I was a kid, I was always interested in creative stuff. I, like most kids, I enjoyed you know drawing and crayons and stuff. Mm. Um, when, when I was, I don't know, 10 to 12 years old, um, we would go to the movies quite a bit, my family and I, and, um, my, my mother would drop us, myself and, and a couple of my uh, neighborhood friends, drop us off at the local theater for the Saturday kids matinee. And, um, I, I was just completely awestruck by the fact that films could take us on these journeys. 
<clears throat> that we could go places we couldn't go in real life. Um, we could be shown and made to think about stuff that uh, wasn't part of real life. Mm. And um, so I, I was intrigued by the stories, but also by the, the craft and technique and, and what these people, whoever they were, were able to do to take us on these journeys. And I, I got fascinated by the creative aspect of filmmaking. And um, so I, I had, uh, I would make little sets um, out of cardboard and so forth, just to create 3D spaces. Mm. And one of my initial thoughts was, well, <clears throat> having seen 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, um, I looked at that and I said, wow, what great creation of, of um, uh, fantasy, but, uh, but it looks like it's real and those people are in that space. So I became interested in production design. I didn't know it was called that at that point. Mm. There was the guys who made the sets. And um, so I, I, I sort of thought of that as the creative aspect of film because, you know, you watch a movie, you sort of are aware of the fact that you're looking at something. You're not aware, I don't think, as, a, as an early viewer, and even now, the fact that the reason you can see it is because some cinematographer captured what was out there and put it onto, in, in my day, film, now into digital, so that we can experience whatever is out there, sets, locations, performances, and so forth. So uh, I, I became fascinated with production design, but then eventually I began to see that the, the guys with the really great um, sort of control of, uh, how the storytelling is, were cinematographers. Um, when I was in high school, I went across the street, uh, Main Street in Alhambra, to the local camera store. And I was looking around because I had set up a little dark room in my, my room downstairs and was interested in photography and capturing images. Went across the street to this camera shop and there was a, uh, a newsstand in there, magazine stand. And one of the magazines was American Cinematographer. Mm. And I thought, oh, this is about filmmaking. And I got an issue, looked through it and said, wow, these guys have the coolest job ever. Look, they are running the camera and they're lighting the thing and they're capturing the image. I read the thing cover to cover. The next month, I rushed over and got the next edition. Um, and I, each month, for about, I don't know, four or five months, I would go and get the next issue. Mm. Finally, my mother consented and said, okay, we'll get you a subscription. And that became sort of my window at, at an early age, high school, um, to cinematography and the, the guys who capture the images. And uh, that's, I think that's when I sort of uh, decided that I wanted to um, go into cinematography and be part of um, that aspect of filmmaking. Over a period of time, obviously, cinematography ha has changed. Um, how we see films has changed. Uh, you know, you, you look at the very early silent films, and um, they look to us uh, as kind of crude, black and white, flickery, not always sharp because it's a copy of a copy of not a copy. In real, of a, not in real motion. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and the, the storytelling is bigger and broader. Um, and I think that's because er, early filmmaking came from the concept of photographing theater. And performances for, for theater, especially in those days, were very big and broad. Um, makeup was, um, you know, Theatrical. very, very stylized. Yeah. 
So, um, but over a period of time, we've we've come to accept a very more natural view of the world around us. Um, sometimes not natural because it's science fiction-y or superheroes or whatever. But um, it somehow seems more real to us. Well, then here comes digital and here comes uh, the computer. And it now gives us almost um, unfettered uh, control of the image. We can do almost anything we want. In fact, we could probably do anything we want. Um, and so I, I think that over a period of time, the audience's view of the stories, the view that the cinematographer provided, um, has gotten a lot more complex. And very often, um, it involves a lot more people. You know, yes, there are simple dramas, um, simple romantic comedies, um, which essentially are photographing actors' characters um, going through a story. But then there's the other end of it, which are these gigantic, epic action films and, and superhero films and so forth, which take us into a world that is essentially completely impossible, as we know it anyway mm -hmm. now, um, with the ability for characters to fly and buildings to be destroyed by a guy's punch and, you know, things like that. So um, our, our credibility um, is being challenged. But in order to do that, it takes an awful lot of people. It takes visual effects people and um, production designers and special effects people, mechanical effects and, and cinematographers and, and, you know, just a, a lot of different skills and artists. So I, I think that uh, no one person now um, really sort of controls the storytelling for those kinds of films. Even the director, who in theory is the mastermind of that, um, in practicality, if you watch the process of a big action film or whatever being made, mm. you realize that the director is the guiding force, but very often um, people who are in visual effects or, or whatever, uh, even writers, um, do what, what I call going into business for themselves. They, um, they create the images or the techniques or the, or the uh, effects or whatever, kind of the way they would like to do it. And then they present it, and very often the director or producer will say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's good. That's even better than I thought it would mm -hmm. be. So um, it's becoming more of a community effort. And the trick is to keep that community focused on, um, I think, what is essential. We, we, we as, as cinematographers, <clears throat> we've always been uh, focused, no pun intended. Okay, maybe that's <laughs> um, We've always been focused on um, capturing an image that an audience will understand and believe and you know especially in the 30s and 40s when that was sort of the limits of what you could do human stories mm -hmm. comedies um, thrillers and so forth um, over a period of time the um, the cinematographer who was so much a part of and was the right or left hand of the director um, has become one of the contributors. And, and I, I hate to see some of that, the skill and artistry of the cinematographer um, disappear, uh, be overridden, um, which is possible because, um, you know, for, for many years, we as cinematographers were in charge of the science. And there's a tremendous amount of science in cinematography, um, lenses and depth of field and how many lumens come out of a 
2K light and what's the exposure contrast ratio and on and on and on. And that was sort of um, what we contributed to the process. Handling all of that science, but very importantly, with an understanding of the artistry, of the visual storytelling, and how to accomplish what a director and what a writer and what performers and the, and the production designer wanted to uh, have end up on the, on the film, um, we were responsible for capturing it and adding our own sensibilities, our own artistry, uh, our own skills to the process so that we could, um, you know, that, for instance, it's very much about composition of a shot that tells an audience where they're supposed to look when. The lighting of the shot creates the mood. Um, will also tell the audience where to look. So as cinematographers, we have always had to understand that. How do we, you know, touch an audience? How do we, you know, tell a story so that their, their brain and their heart, um, you know, embrace it? So I, I think that uh, I, I'm leery of, um, of it, um, you know, becoming too fragmented. Um, you know, the, the fact that I would take an image and say that's the perfect one and then have someone say, you know what I think would be better and change it. Now, if it's better, fine. But if it just happens to be someone exerting control or whatever um, for their own satisfaction, gratification, um, then I think it's an unfortunate thing. We should all, all be working for the movie. We should all be working for the audience. Um, something I've always felt, you know, we don't, we shouldn't work for ourselves. We should bring ourselves to a project on behalf of the audience. What's the best way to tell the story? We as cinematographers have to learn more science. We have to understand computers and, and what the compositing guys are doing and how they're doing it. We have to understand how we supply the right parts, the right pieces, the right images to them yeah. so that uh, our contribution is not, you know, just, you know, somebody saying, oh, well, that's okay, but let's, let's wipe out that area. And that area seems too dark to me. And mm -hmm. maybe the frame should be over here. So let's blow it up a little and move it. You know. And um, I've, I've heard these, these um, portentous um, predictions that um, what, what some of the producers want is the ability to shoot in 8K, a wide shot, and then decide after the fact how to light it how to compose it, you know, let's, we, we need a close-up here, now we'll do the two-shot, now the other close-up here. The computer here. becomes the de facto cinematographer almost. Exactly, and, and all of it um, controlled by maybe some guy who doesn't understand uh, images and visual storytelling and, and um, how to touch an audience, you know, it's, um, you know, I've had, I've had experiences where um, I, would work on the film with a director and we have a stylish shot done. Producer would say, but where are the close-ups? Where are the close-ups? Well, we, you don't need it because see how these characters, in? no, 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 we need close-ups. Well, the producer had come out of television where he had learned that the human face close-up is what the audience needs to understand the dialogue and so forth. Not, not true. Um, so when I went to the screening of this particular film, I was amazed to see some close-ups that we hadn't done. Huh. And he had blown up a two-shot, and the close-up was facing the wrong direction, and it was very grainy, and it was, you know, unusual. Well, he had this overriding concept in his mind that you needed close-ups, and he exerted his influence. Hmm. 
And as a result, um, in my humble estimation, degraded the, um, the actual work that we had all carefully thought about. Mm. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm leery that that kind of control will uh, keep, you know, the, the, the people who are truly concerned with visual storytelling from um, being able to, you know, uh, perform their mm. skills and artistry. You're very involved in mentorship uh, through the ASC, like so many members are. Um, you had a pretty amazing experience as a as a college student uh, at uh, UCLA. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? With uh, who was your uh, teacher and uh, mm. who influenced you somewhat? Well, <clears throat> in um, at UCLA, I, I got interested in truly being a cinematographer. And uh, there were a couple classes, but they were um, very theoretical. One book we had um, that was cinematography was just purely the science. It was, you know, color science and, and depth of field and discussed all of this. And there, there was nothing that was really about um, the visual artistry, the visual storytelling. And uh, my last semester, I heard that they were going to have a special cinematography class. And it was going to be taught by James Wong Howe. Oh. James Wong Howe, Academy Award winning, um, very uh, important cinematographer. He came up from the silent period. He came up, um, you know, through uh, great black and white films and and um, he was about that age when he was, uh, I think, in his late 70s. Mm. And um, he was going to teach this class. And I was uh, able to weasel my way into it mm -hmm. because it was my last semester. Mm. And it was an amazing class because um, we would build a little set, a little three-walled set, which would have a window and a door and some interesting wallpaper or whatever on the stage. Mm -hmm. And each, um, I think it was twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, each class, he would show up, he would talk a little bit about some theory, and then he would make us become the crew. And each each time uh, somebody would be designated the operator, camera assistant, and we had an old Mitchell um, and um, gaffer, electricians, key grip, and each time we would become this crew, and and he would teach us the practical aspects. Um, no, 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 no! Don't do that to uncoil the cable first, then, and open the barn doors, then you turn the light on. Hmm. And, uh, oh, oh, okay. So we, we learned practical stuff. In the meantime, he was saying, okay, now, this set, today, it is a CD hotel room. Hmm. And he'd say, so let's put a light out the window that shines up, and we'll put a student on there blinking it, because that's the neon sign. Then it's dark and a little light over here. And so we would create this, and, I, and we could see the, the creative process that he went through, mm. teaching you to analyze what is the shot about, how do you create that mood. Then the next class, we'd switch around, become other crew people, and he would say, okay, today this is a, uh, a fancy lady's boudoir the opposite. Now, what's the thought process of turning the same mm -hmm. um, set into a different look, mm. just with lighting and where the camera goes and so forth? It was um, the most revealing class I had taken in the whole time. Mm. Um, then he would, um, uh, also we would go to the theater and he would run dailies from 
something he was working on. I think the heart is a lonely hunter. Um, and he would run clips out of films. And he would talk about the creative process. We had practical look mm. at it. It became one of the, the best classes I had ever taken. So revealing, so practical, um, that that's what I've tried to, to do myself. Um, you know, I just recently taught a, a uh, university level class and made the students become the crew um, and um, would talk them through the process and teach them how to use the equipment, how to, how to use a light and so forth. Mm. Because um, that practical aspect may mean that they can actually get a job working on somebody's film if they understand it. How, what's the protocol? Right. Um, who do you listen to? Who do you make suggestions to? Um, you, you know, you don't go up to the director and say, yeah, you know, that seems like a silly way to compose this or to the camera operator, you know. No, there's certain protocols yeah. and, and that may help them become um, a desirable crew member where they can actually do entry level work and, and so forth. So, so um, you know, that, that class I had from James Wong Howe um, so impressed me that that's what I've tried to emulate. Mm -hmm. As I talk to students and I teach and, and so forth, one of the first things I do is um, I ask them about their viewing. What do they watch? And I say, how many here have, have seen um, Casablanca? And maybe two of them. And I'll say, how about you, if any of you uh, know who Humphrey Bogart is? And um, how many have seen a black and white film? <laughs> and I'm surprised at how few students actually understand the history of, of you know, filmmaking. So their, their view is just the most recent movies. And um, sometimes those are good. Sometimes um, the, the recent movies are made really cool by guys who want to make something really cool. And uh, the best way to do that is to turn the camera upside down or something mm. weird. Um, without understanding, uh, how do you tell a story? How do you engage an audience? How do we take the hundred years of learning a new language literally, the visual language of, of film and storytelling, how do, you, uh, how do you build on that? And you know, it's like saying, well, I'm, a, I'm an English major. Um, I'm actually a professor of English. So who? Charles Dickens? No, never read him. Mark Twain. Wait, I've heard the name. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't think of teaching English without understanding where did it all come from and how can it be used or modernized or how can we dip back and to tell a story in old English because that section gives authenticity to, you know, some book you're writing, some novel. Um, so I, I think it's sad when, uh, first of all, kids in high school are not taught film history, film literature, because so much of their world now is exactly. television. Yeah. Um, how many of them actually read books for fun? Not, not as many as there should be. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, how many of them have seen films and understand where their language of visual understanding comes from? Okay. Right. So I'm, I'm often disappointed by that. And, and very often I'll try to show them clips from old movies. And I'll try to ignore the yawning, <laughs> you know. Um, I'll ignore the sighing, <sighs> you know, that kind, of, that kind of stuff. Because I try to make it relevant. I'll mm. say, look, it, here is um, telling a, a scene with one shot, one mm. moving camera. Mm. Watch how it engages us. Watch how we pay attention to the 
characters and not the cutting and not the cutaways. Life is one long steady cam shot. It's not even handheld <laughs> because handheld, you know, has this kind of jerky. Yeah. Or now it's a gimbal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, now it's, uh, you know, and as, as people, our brain, our eyes, you know, correct so that we get this impression of moving through life mm. in one long continuous shot with the exception that we cut every now and then mm. when we go to sleep. Mm. <laughs> so uh, we have to wrap up, but I, I'm, I'm curious about um, you've, you, you've covered so many different, you know, popular genres um, in your work that's very <coughs> widely known and loved. Uh, what might you want to do that you haven't done yet? I've gotten interested recently in sort of um, smaller indie films because you can uh, you can really be creatively in control. Mm. You you can getting back to yeah get, yeah exactly getting back to um, working with a director, mm. working with performers. Um, very often, you know, it's not about big special effects. Um, mm -hmm. It it can be about visual effects because they've gotten so much easier and less expensive and and um, you know they can add to a film um, special effects or they can just do things like removing um, billboards and things that are uh, you know annoying in the shot mm. um, that would normally have made you do something else mm. you can with some knowledge of visual effects, mm. say, oh, let's, let's get the shot we really need and we'll fix it. Mm. So um, I, I like small um, storytelling films mm. that uh, where you can apply, you know, the old um, sort of techniques of visual storytelling. Mm. I've seen some, uh, some Eastern European films uh, not too long ago, and that's what you see. You you, you don't see effects. You see pure story. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so that's refreshing. So, um, an indie film in your future? Um, no, I'm working with a director. I I did a film for, um, ostensibly for Netflix, uh, directed by this um, youngish fellow, and um, it was. Quite a bit of fun, and we developed a mutual relationship, mm. and mutual respect. So uh, he's uh, developing a couple more projects, and um, so I'm hoping that we'll go off on this adventure again together. Mm. Um, you know, and and I'll be more involved from the beginning, so it'll be a little more, um, you know, kind of all inclusive mm. creativity. How do you stay inspired creatively? <clears> hmm. <throat> well, staying, staying inspired creatively is, um, I think one of the one of the things that either you can do, or, you know, if if you are really interested in what's next, um, and how do you apply the old tried and true aspects of storytelling. Mm -hmm. Um, and understanding how people perceive stories visually, you know, um, and, you know, uh, using the old style, the, the, uh, the reality of how the brain perceives and the eye and the mind and all that, mm. um, and also how the heart wants to understand relationships between characters and a story and so forth. Mm. Applying those aspects continuously to, um, you know, new, new stories. So um, I, I enjoy, you know, the puzzle, mm. the puzzle of, of, you know, taking, you know, tried and true techniques and passing them on. Mm. Dean Cundy, thank you very much for joining us for this conversation. Mm -hmm. We have to wrap it up, but uh, it was really a treat to meet you and get a little insight from you and your background. Well, it's and been my, my pleasure. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Of course.
That's it for Full Exposure from the ASC in Hollywood. I'm your host, Jim Camp. Tony Wisniewski is our executive producer. Dan Walnicki is our editor. Susan Jacob is the colorist. Our associate producers are Kat Cantillo, Huda Khalid, and Stacey Taylor. In Hollywood, Mike Valinsky co-produced. Donna Kinski was our cinematographer. Sarah Thomas Moffat was our gaffer. Zolt Magyar was our sound mixer. And Dane Gerwig was our first AC. Our thanks to the American Society of Cinematographers for all their help. Our special thanks to Bill Bennett, Richard Crudo, and Dean Cundy, and John Simmons, ASC. Also thanks to Case Von Oostrom, ASC, Patty Armacost, Alex Lopez, and Tisha Calmeadow. Special thanks to Zeiss Cine LA, Snehal Patel, and Kylie Hazard. Cameras were supplied by Alternative Rentals in LA. Catch us on Instagram at Zeiss underscore Full Exposure or on the web at ZeissFullExposure.com.